uh, the first two at this point. And because it seems like plaintiff is proceeding under a theory of defamation by implication, under the Pendleton case, 290 Virginia 162, plaintiff bears the burden of proving that the statements at issue were designed and intended by Ms. Heard to imply a defamatory meaning designed and intended to imply defamatory meaning. So, and to satisfy those first two elements, publication and uh, falsity and defamation or defamatory nature of the statements, Mr. Depp bears the burden of proving that by a preponderance of the evidence. And to satisfy the requisite intent and show that Ms. Heard acted with actual malice, he has a heightened standard of proof that he must prove uh, by clear and convincing evidence that Ms. Heard acted with that malice. So just want to talk about the two, the, 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 the two statements on domestic abuse in the op-ed. Um, and Your Honor is well aware of the ample Virginia case laws talking about how you have to view the op-ed as a whole. You have to view words in context. So these are the, the statements that, that read, then two years ago I became a public figure representing domestic abuse. And then the other statement that says, I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protect men accused of abuse. Now, those statements are entirely opinion, except for, according to Mr. Depp, the uh, d discussion of domestic abuse. So the statement, I became a public figure representing domestic abuse, and the statement in the second uh, sentence that Mr. Depp was uh, a man accused of abuse. The rest of those are inactionable opinion statements. Now, the evidence adduced thus far, Your Honor, uh, shows that Mr. Depp can't sustain a claim on these for two reasons. First of all, the statements are true on their face. I don't think that there's any dispute about that, and that's been the subject of, of some testimony in this case. Uh, two years before she wrote the op-ed, Ms. Heard did, in fact, become a public figure representing domestic abuse when she obtained a domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, and the, Mr. Depp was indeed in, accused of abuse. Those are facts that are true. Now, to the extent that Mr. Depp will argue that he's proceeding on a defamation by implication claim, again, um, the court should grant the motion to strike because the undisputed evidence is that he did, in fact, abuse Amber. Now, there is there's a dispute in this case. There's ample evidence that he physically abused Amber, but we acknowledge that there's a dispute in this case on that. But what there isn't a dispute in this case is non-physical abuse. Both Mr. Depp and his expert, Shannon Curry, have testified that abuse may come in many forms. It may be physical, certainly, but it may also be verbal, may be emotional, may be psychological. You'll recall Mr. Depp um, even kind of setting the baseline for what abuse was when he talked about the non-physical abuse that he allegedly suffered at the hands of his mother. He said it was worse than the beatings, and the example he gave was that his mom used to, uh, used to call him one eye as an example. Um, because he had a, a lazy eye, I guess, as a child. That was something that Mr. Depp himself said was abuse, his mom calling him one eye. So we setting aside the evidence of physical abuse in this case, which is already overwhelming, Mr. Depp's claims relating to these two statements should be stricken because of the ample and undisputed evidence in the record of non-physical abuse by Mr. Depp toward Ms. Heard. There's evidence in the record of recordings, messages, including messages written in blood, um, for, with his finger, blood and paint, vile names, shouting, menacing and threatening statements. Um, the, there's the video, the kitchen video in Sweetser. There's the audio of him calling Miss Heard, um, like I say, numerous vile names. There's the audio of him asking to her to cut him um, and whether she wanted to be cut. So there's there's, there's plenty of evidence out of the words or out of the mouth of the plaintiff in this case that constitutes non-physical abuse of misheard. Again, under the standards set forth by his expert and, he, and the plaintiff himself. Those are far worse than his mother calling him one eye when he was a child. In addition to that, Your Honor, there's Travis McGivern's testimony from yesterday in which he testified that at a minimum on the night of March 23rd, 2015, both parties were being verbally abusive to each other. Mr. McGivern also testified about Mr. Depp, quote, rearranging her closet, throwing racks of clothing down onto the floor and throwing at least one rack down the stairs. Now in California, property damage alone can be a basis for getting a, tem a, a temporary restraining order under California law. So further evidence of non-physical abuse or non-physical toward misheard. You saw the cupboards in the sweets or kitchen video. And then Dr. Laurel Anderson, Your Honor, testified that she believed that the parties engaged in mutual abuse and that, that 
least some of the time that that was initiated by Mr. Depp. This is all evidence we haven't gotten to put on our case yet. And to the extent that this case proceeds, and that will start now, but this is all evidence that has come in while plaintiff controls the playing field of what evidence has come in, and he can't overcome that. In this case, Your Honor, if Mr. Depp abused Ms. Hurd physically, verbally, emotionally, or psychologically even one time, then she wins on those claims. Then she wins. It's that simple. And the evidence is overwhelming and undisputed in the ways that I've just described that he did. So for that reason, Your Honor, those claims should be stricken. And I'll just cite the Union of Needle Trades versus Jones case. This is 268 Virginia 512 that states, if the plaintiff does not establish the falsity of the statement by a preponderance of the evidence in his case in chief, he has not met his threshold burden and the trial court should strike the evidence and grant summary judgment to the defendant. That's exactly what should happen here. Now I'll move on to the second uh, issue, which is the headline um, containing the phrase sexual violence. That should be stricken for a couple reasons. Well, first, Your Honor, the evidence has established that Ms. Hurd didn't write the headline. Uh, Mr. Doherty from the ACLU, that, that's the only evidence that's come in in this case thus far. And plaintiffs control the evidence. Well, I understand, but there's also a stipulation that Ms. Hurd would not be called in the plaintiff's case because they would then use her testimony for part of their case in your case, right? I'm, I'm not, and that's, I'm not, that's correct, Your Honor. Yeah, so, I agree. And that goes to a different issue that I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing that the court should strike because they haven't put Ms. Hurd on to say, well, to testify but, about the headline. But that, I assume part of that would be that they would, that what they, I hope they, I guess they intend to get from Ms. Hurd is that she, she either wrote it or republished it. Yeah, what know. happened the next day is Ms. Hurd posted it on her Instagram account and said, look what I published yesterday in the Washington Post. So she adopted the title and, and her name was on the article which okay. contained the title. No, but the, and Mr. Ronborn, the only reason I'm sorry to interrupt no, that's you, I, the only, only, because I know that was a stipulation, so it's hard for me to say that that's all the evidence for motion to strike if there's a stipulation that they're still going to get more evidence in on that particular issue. I think, and I'm happy to, to hand the court the transcript of the, the April 8th hearing, because one of the things that I, we're not arguing today is that because they haven't put in evidence of the, I think it was a tweet, but Mr. Chu says it was Instagram, I don't know, whatever it was, that because there it was- It was a tweet adopting the op-ed she published okay. the okay. day before in the Washington Post. Okay. All right, so what I'm not arguing today is that because they haven't gotten that tweet into evidence or had Ms. Hurd say that she tweeted that, that we're entitled to, to summary judgment at this point. I'm not arguing that, but that's all that we discuss on April 8th, and I'm happy to hand the transcript up, Your Honor. And okay. we actually never, it wasn't a stipulation, it was simply a, an agreement that they didn't need to call her in their case in right. chief to make that point. And then and then Ms. Bredehoff said, we'd have to agree on the language of any stipulation, and they haven't proposed anything to us and haven't gotten back to us. So I think that that's only relevant. To, we're not basing our request for, for, for motion to strike here on Ms. Hurd not having testified to sending that tweet. But, but you're saying for the motion to strike, the only evidence before the court is that the Washington Post wrote that title. Co correct. And that's, a, that's, that's very different from what happened the next day. There's, it, the, the stipulation didn't go toward who wrote the title. That was never part of anything. And it's undisputed, and Ms. Hurd will testify that she didn't write the title. Well, I understand that, but, it, but it, I think It's not undisputed, Your Honor. I okay. apologize for interrupting. Okay. But I, I think the issue is that whether it was republication. Well, and I'll, I'll, so that, I'll get to that next. But but I know, it, but the, see, the problem is, how do I do a motion to strike when that evidence isn't before me yet? Well, the republication isn't, so, so the evidence that's before you is that the Washington Post wrote the headline or that Ms. Heard didn't. And I, that's the only evidence, and that's right. not gonna change. The, Repub the, the tweet, which was the only subject of the, the discussion of the pretrial conference, where there was no stipulation, it was just an agreement that we're not gonna base a motion to strike on them not introducing evidence of the tweet. That, that was what it was. I'm happy to hand the transcript up if Your Honor would like to see that. But that isn't actionable because under the Lakova versus Halper case, 995 F3rd 134, retweeting a link doesn't constitute republication. Now that case doesn't Well, it, it does if you add something to it, but I just don't know the evidence. Your, your, your Honor, very quickly, it's a judicial admission. They admitted in Ms. Hurd's answer, she admitted to the tweet. So that establishes that she adopted the op-ed in its entirety, and it was discussed. We talked about judicial admissions. One was the op-ed itself. 
The second, and this is reflected in the Your Honor, if I could finish my argument, I mean, I would appreciate it. I can't wait to oppose this. I don't know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, So, and again, we can we can look at the transcript. You understand my concern. I do understand your concern, and I guess what I'm saying is that there's two levels. One is there's no dispute, and there's not going to be a dispute, that she did not write the headline. So then you look at, is the tweet actionable? And the argument here is that as a matter of law, retweeting something isn't actionable. And so, as under the Lakova case, 995 F3rd 134, in that case dealt with hyperlinks and how those aren't actionable. But to be very clear, nothing that was discussed on April 8th, nothing that was discussed at that pretrial conference was in any way relating to any stipulation about who wrote the headline. It was simply that they need not call Ms. Hurd in their case in chief to get her to say that she sent a certain tweet. And that tweet's not in evidence yet, but I assume that they'll try to put it in evidence at some point. But that's, the tweet doesn't need to be in evidence for you to strike this claim on that basis. So, even assuming, even assuming that the headline implied certain conduct by Mr. Depp, again, Mr. Depp can't meet his burden of proof on this. Third, Your Honor, he can't prove that Ms. Hurd acted with actual malice. Mr. Depp hasn't introduced evidence sufficient to permit him to meet this. Now, again, this is a heightened burden of proof. He has to show actual malice by clear and convincing evidence. And as the vote... Hurd's intent on April 8th, which of course we didn't. But the only evidence that has been presented in this case, Your Honor, by Mr. Doherty, was that the op-ed wasn't Ms. Hurd's idea, that the ACLU asked her to write the op-ed, and indeed that they even wrote the first draft, and then that Ms. Hurd vetted the finished article with her lawyers and with lawyers from the ACLU to make sure that it wasn't problematic. That is the only evidence in the record. And on that evidence, there cannot be a conclusion that Ms. Hurd acted with the actual malice that's necessary, particularly when you consider the heightened burden of proof. So reviewing the op-ed as a whole, with the court acting in its appropriate function as a gatekeeper of the First Amendment, we ask that the court strike plaintiff's evidence and award summary judgment to Ms. Hurd, either in whole or in part. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court, Ben Chu for Plaintiff Johnny Depp. It's just still morning. Your Honor, if I may approach. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I've just handed to Mr. Rottenborn and Your Honor an opposition that we prepared before we had the benefit of seeing Ms. Hurd's affirmative motion to strike that I think we've anticipated the arguments made, such as they are. The court should deny Defendant Amber Hurd's motion to strike because Mr. Depp has come forward in his case in chief with multiple credible witnesses, documents, and authentic tape recordings of Ms. Hurd herself, not only satisfying all of the requisite elements of his claim for defamation, including actual malice, but also going the extra mile of showing that Ms. Hurd physically abused him. She's the abuser in this courtroom. Your Honor, going back to the standard, as Your Honor is well aware, in considering a motion to strike, the trial court must view the evidence and all reasonable inferences drawn from the evidence in light of the most, in the light most favorable to the plaintiff. Any reasonable doubt as to whether the plaintiff has produced sufficient evidence of the wrong alleged must be resolved in the plaintiff's favor 
and the motion to strike denied, unquote. And that's the uh, Boeing case, I believe, Mr. Rottenborn referred to, 243 Virginia 81 at 81, 1992. Quote, the weight and credibility of the testimony of witnesses are solely matters for the jury. The jury may accept that part of the testimony it believes and reject that which it does not. It is also within the exclusive province of the jury to draw any reasonable inferences from the evidence before it, citing Rate versus Minix, 275 Virginia, 579 at 585. In deference and respect to the court's time, Mr. Depp incorporates by reference the legal analysis set forth in the court's opinion letter dated March 27, 2020, overruling Ms. Hurd's demurra to the three defamatory statements at issue. And that letter opinion is attached as Exhibit 1 to Mr. Depp's opposition. That's where the court uh, fulfilled its proper gatekeeping uh, role that Mr. Rottenborn referred to. As a threshold matter, the elements of a defamation claim are the following. Publication of an actionable statement with the requisite intent, citing the Shaker versus Bonfault case 290 Virginia 81 at 91. As to damages, they are presumed here because Ms. Hurd's false allegations of domestic abuse, sexual assault, and rape constitute defamation per se, citing the Tronfield case, 272 Virginia 709-713, a 2006 case. As the court noted at page three of its opinion letter, typically an editorial or op-ed column is ordinarily not actionable because it appears in a place devoted to or in a manner usually thought of as representing personal viewpoints, id. However, Virginia recognizes that, quote, a defamatory charge may be made by inference, implication, or insinuation, citing the Carwell case. And a statement expressing a defamatory meaning may not be apparent on its face, citing Pendleton, with which the court is quite familiar, 290 Virginia at 172. Accordingly, in order to render words defamatory and actionable, it is not necessary that the defamatory charge be in direct terms, but may be made indirectly, and it matters not how artful or disguised the mode, modes in which the meaning is concealed, if it is in fact defamatory. Carwile 196, Virginia at seven. And based on the authority and reasoning set forth in pages four through eight of the opinion letter, the three statements at issue are actionable under a theory of defamation by implication. Mr. Depp established in his case in chief that Ms. Hurd, in fact, made all three of the defamatory statements at issue. As the court admitted into evidence as plaintiff's exhibit one, the op-ed Ms. Hurd published in her own name in the Washington Post on December 18th, 2018. And let's take the three statements and the proof that has been adduced. Statement number one, Amber Hurd, quote, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change. Per page six of the opinion letter, the first statement could reasonably convey the alleged defamatory meaning, i.e. that Mr. Depp abused Ms. Hurd, to its readers without extending the words beyond their ordinary and common accept acceptation. See Pendleton 290 Virginia at 172, also citing the Carwell case. Resolving every fair inference in Mr. Depp's favor, this statement could reasonably imply that the sexual violence Ms. Heard spoke up against was in fact perpetrated by Mr. Depp. Mr. Depp produced several credible witnesses and documents proving that Ms. Heard was implying that he committed sexual violence against her. Mr. Depp himself testified to that, as did his sister, Christy Dombrowski. Mr. Depp's former agent, Christian Carino, testified that as did his current, uh, current agent, Jack Wiggum. But perhaps most convincing of all, and most disgusting of all, was the testimony of the ACLU's Terrence Doherty, a lawyer nonetheless. Mr. Doherty testified, uh, uh, among other things, uh, that when, the op -ed, the, when they were pitching the op-ed to the Washington Post, it, he, they stated, hey, Michael, 
wondering if we might interest you in a piece by Amber Heard, who, as you may recall, was beaten up during her brief marriage to Johnny Depp on what the incoming Congress can do to help protect women in similar situations. Uh, Mr. Doherty also testified that uh, everybody understood, as Ms. Heard and the ACLU clearly intended, that these, this statement and the other two statements referred directly to Mr. Depp. Quote, this is an article that was in USA Today and specifically ties Amber's statement in her op-ed piece to Johnny Depp. And when Jessica Weitz, who actually wrote the op-ed that Ms. Heard later adopted, she says, quote, to Mr. Doherty, so much for not mentioning JD when the USA Today made clear that they, like everybody else who read the op-ed, understood that as Ms. Heard clearly intended, it referred to Mr. Depp, which makes her Instagram post two days before the trial began that she didn't mention Mr. Depp all the more outrageous. Uh, Your, Your Honor, uh, there is um, Ms. Shulman, also of the ACLU, acknowledged that Ms. Heard's op-ed referred to Mr. Depp. Uh, so it's very clear that the ACLU and Ms. Heard intended, that, that was the whole purpose of this, so that they could get interest in this and it would coincide with the premier of Aquaman, because otherwise no one would have been interested in anything written by Ms. Heard. Mr. Doherty also testified that Ms. Heard only paid 1.3, actually she didn't even pay all that, out of the $3.5 million that she had pledged to the ACLU, and then they helped her lie about it. And it's one thing, Your Honor, uh, for her to stiff the ACLU, which frankly played a reprehensible role in this case, it's quite another for her to fail to honor her obligation to the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles with sick and dying children. Uh, and that she failed to do as well. Uh, and as Your Honor has mentioned, uh, the fact that she put her name on that article uh, means that she is responsible for all of those statements. Uh, which she specifically adopted later. And I'll go through the other two statements quickly, Your Honor. Well, can we stay on this one for one moment, though? Yes, Your Honor. Because do you agree that the only evidence before that we've heard in this trial, uh, as far as the title of the op-ed, is that even Mr. Darby, I, I believe, testified to it, that it was something that Washington Post wrote? Well, for the, for the one that, online. That, he's not our witness, Your Honor. That's a, a witness from the ACLU. Well, I understand, the but court. it's the only evidence I have. I respectfully okay. disagree, Your Honor. All what, right. What the only real evidence Your Honor has is Plaintiff's Exhibit 1, which is Amber Heard putting her name on the entire article, including the title. That is the only evidence before you. The ACLU was a co-conspirator with Ms. Heard, and whether they say, oh, maybe the Washington Post wrote it, that's not the end of the story. All she has done is create an issue, of uh, an issue of fact as to whether she wrote the title or not. So you're, but, you're saying just having that exhibit in evidence is absolutely, enough? Absolutely. Absolutely, Your Honor. Her name is on the article. Okay. What, what does an average reader expect? So that alone is sufficient to beat a motion to strike. If they want to come back later and say, gee, she didn't write the title, as if that were a defense. I, I hope they make that argument. I hope they make that argument to the jury, because it's about as credible as her, as her argument that, oh, I wasn't referring to, to Johnny Depp. She didn't have to. And the testimony of Terrence Doherty was very clear that when they took out the references to Johnny Depp, no one was interested in this article anymore. So she said, put it back in, put it back in, make it more spicy so people would read. Otherwise. She couldn't get it in the Washington Post. It would be back in Teenage Vogue, which is the other publication that was considering publishing it, because no one was interested in what she had to say in which, in, in, unless she was defaming Mr. Depp. But if I could go to the second statement, and I'll try to be quick, Your Honor. Two years ago, I became a public figure representing domestic abuse, and I felt the full force of our culture's wrath for women who speak out. As for the second statement, defendant called herself a public figure representing domestic abuse, which can be read to imply that she became a representative of domestic abuse because she was abused by Mr. Depp, not, because, not just because she spoke out against alleged abuse. This inference can be drawn without extending the language beyond its ordinary 
common acceptation, citing Carwile 196, Virginia, at 8. Uh, Your Honor, quote, to constitute a publication, it is not necessary that the contents of the writing should be made, made known to the public generally. It is enough, it is said, if they are made known to a single person, unquote, citing Snyder versus Fatherly, 158, Virginia, 335 at 350. Everybody and his grandmother testified that Ms. Hurd was referring to her bogus ex-party TRO that she obtained on May 27, 2016. And it was interesting that Mr. Depp's own lawyer uh, said that she wasn't even provided notice. So Ms. Hurd made very sure that Mr. Depp wouldn't have notice of the ex-party TRO. And Ms. Hurd herself, the evidence shows, knew that Mr. Depp, having just suffered the loss of his mother, was already on the other side of the country, was already in New York at the time of this TRO, and was heading to Europe for several weeks. So she knew she didn't need any protection from him. This was just a scam for her to get the $7 million in the divorce settlement that she said she gave to the ACLU. She swore she gave to the ACLU and the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and she pocketed instead. Mr. Depp, Ms. Dombrowski, Mr. Carino, Mr. Wiggum, and the inimitable Mr. Doherty of the ACLU, which lent its once respected name to Ms. Hurd's defamation. So while Ms. Hurd may have avoided any direct mention of Mr. Depp's name, there is extensive testimony and evidence in the record showing that the implication of her op-ed could not be more clear, i.e., that Mr. Depp abused Ms. Hurd during the course of their marriage. Under Virginia law, quote, it is not necessary that the defamatory charge be in direct terms, but it may be made indirectly. And it matters not how artful or disguised the modes in which the meaning is concealed if it is in fact defamatory, citing Carwile. Well, we can argue as to how artful it was, but the implication was very clear as the court has previously uh, ruled, or not law of the case, but as the court has uh, persuasively written in its opinion letter. Let's move to the falsity of Ms. Hurd's ever-evolving and ever-escalating change of IPV and sexual assault. Mr. Depp's sworn denial is all he needs to survive a motion to strike, but there's a lot more than that, Your Honor, and I'll try to be brief. Three police officers, actually four, but the three who have testified already, Officers Sines, Haddon, and Gatlin, testified unequivocally that Ms. Hurd did not have a mark on her on the evening of May 21, 2016. Uh, and I, I could go through, uh, I'll just go through very quickly. Officer Haddon, uh, uh, strike that, Officer Melissa Sines on a jury trial day 10. Question, did you provide a copy of this pamphlet to Amber Hurd? Answer, I did not. I didn't identify her as a victim of domestic abuse. The next day, Officer Melissa Science. Okay, at this time, did you notice any injuries on Ms. Hurd? Officer Science, I did not. Question, okay, were you looking to see if she had any injuries on her at the time? Officer Science, yes, I was. Question, and so you were looking to see if Ms. Hurd had any injuries and you determined that she did not. Is that accurate? Officer Science, correct. Question, okay, and was the lighting good enough in the hallway for you to make that determination? Answer, yes, the hallway was well lit. Officer Gatlin's testimony was the same, and he had the body cam. Officer Haddon's testimony was the same. The testimony of nurses Debbie Lloyd and Aaron Boram, who, didn't, who like the police officers, did not work for Mr. Depp. Uh, Mr. Depp. In fact, they, they worked for Dr. Kipper also belie Ms. Hurd's false allegations of abuse. Isaac Baruch and Alejandro Romero both testified that they saw Ms. Hurd repeatedly and in the clear light between May 21, 2021, which was the last time Mr. Depp saw her before leaving on the Hollywood Vampires tour. The next time he was to see her was when Ms. Hurd begged him to come see her in San Francisco, which is hardly the act of a domestic uh, abuse victim. So we have Isaac Baruch and Mr. Romero saying that they saw Ms. Hurd repeatedly 
in the interval of time between May 21 and May 27, when she obtained the farce ex parte TRO, and they saw no marks on her face and no swelling. Uh, two witnesses, Mr. Baruch and Brandon Patterson, saw the video of Ms. Hurd and her sister Whitney pantomiming the fake punch after this alleged uh, incident of abuse. Ms. Hurd's former personal assistant, Kate James, and several other witnesses, including Dr. Kip, Dr. David Kipper, saw no violence by Mr. Depp and no injuries to Ms. Hurd. Indeed, witness after witness has come forward to testify that Ms. Hurd, far from being a domestic figure representing domestic violence, unquote, is in fact a recidivist perpetrator of domestic violence on Mr. Depp uh, and, and others. We have the testimony, uh, the harrowing testimony of Mr. Depp himself, who described several witnesses. One, as Your Honor will recall, when he was hiding in the bathroom after escaping one of her attacks, and uh, she claims to have hurt her foot kicking the door. Mr. Depp opens the door to see if she's hurt, and then she kicks the door in on him and punches him. We have the incident of December 15, 2015, when um, Ms. Hurd uh, threw punches at him wildly at the back and side of his head. Uh, Mr. Depp testified that he ducked and covered to protect his face. Eventually, he turned around to grab her and stop her arms from flailing. Uh, December 15 in the Bahamas. Uh, during an argument, Ms. Hurd grabbed a can of mineral spirits and threw it at Mr. Depp's face, striking him in the forehead, bridge, and nose era, and the jury saw a photograph of the, bru the bridge on the bruise of his nose. We have testimony from Mr. And, and, and by the way, Tara Roberts, who is the manager of the island, confirmed that uh, the incident with the mineral spirits you have Mr. Depp's testimony of what happened on April 22nd, 2016. Uh, and we've heard testimony uh, today from Aaron Boren Pilati that Mr. Depp was very responsive, uh, was very sociable, had not, uh, was not in any way inebriated that day when Ms. Hurd says he was. And she, and she attacked him that, um, she attacked him that night as well. And, I, and I'm getting to, to, to the end of this, Your Honor. We have, um, we have Ms. Hurd's own admissions. We have her um, admitting uh, to hitting Mr. Depp, and her only uh, contention was that she wasn't punch punching him, she was just hitting him. We have testimony from Travis McGivern that uh, missed on February 23rd, 2015, Ms. Hurd threw and hit Mr. Depp with a can of Red Bull and then sucker punched him with a closed fish, fist. Um, finally, we have uh, the rather stunning testimony of, of Ben King, quite a credible witness who accompanied Ms. Hurd on the flight back from Australia, where Ms. Hurd admits to him in a rhetorical question, quote, did you ever totally lose it on someone you love? which was, we would respectfully submit, an admission of her severing the top or the tip of Mr. Depp's figure, a uh, finger. Finally, Your Honor, statement number three, quote, I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protect men accused of abuse. Again, quoting very briefly from page seven of the court's opinion letter, quote, Drawing every fair inference in plaintiff's favor, the court can fairly include, conclude that defendant's statement that she saw how institutions protect men accused of abuse could reasonably convey to its recipients that she saw how Mr. Depp was protected by institutions, that he abused her and spoke up against it. Uh, Your Honor, again, we have multiple testimony from multiple people including Jack Wiggum and all the others, mentioned that this was a um, reference to that. Um, 
Your Honor, again, the, the lies that have already been exposed that Ms. Hurd has told about the charitable contributions, uh, the incidents in this case, and again, I'll just cite a couple of more, uh, the testimony of Isaac Baruch. When Mr. Baruch saw Ms. Hurd on June 3, after she'd gone through with the sham ex-party uh, TRO, and Mr. Baruch was asked, did she say anything in response? And Mr. Baruch testified, yeah. In response to that, she, meaning Ms. Hurd, looks at me and said, I told Johnny I don't want anything. The lawyers are making me do all of this. And I, you know, that's what she said. Well, the lawyers are making her do all of that. And apparently she wanted the $7 million for herself. She even lied about the final insult left on the marital bed after her 30th birthday party. And it was quite telling that she admitted to Starling Jenkins, a former United States Marine, that this was a terrible prank gone awry. Well, she lied about that, too. In fact, she said Mr. Depp was crazy to even allege that she could have done such a thing. Well, she admitted it uh, to um, Mr. Jenkins. Uh, per Tronfield, as cited earlier, Mr. Depp does not have to prove damages because this is defamation per se. In fact, these involve some of the most heinous crimes any man or woman can be accused of. However, he has done so. Uh, Jack Wiggum tested yesterday that the impact of the op-ed was catastrophic on Mr. Depp, Depp's personal and professional life, uh, that it was a $22.5 million loss on uh, Pirate 6 and another $20 million on others. Uh, we've had the um, uh, We've had the testimony, uh, so we had Mr. Wiggum testifying as to the 22 and a half lost on Pirate 6 and another 20 lost on the other films, the other studio films, the indie films, and, and the, other, uh, the other ways Mr. Depp would have made income. We have Richard Marx's testimony, Douglas Banya's testimony, and the testimony of uh, Michael Spindler just this morning. Uh, finally, uh, Your Honor, none of the, Ms. Hurd's affirmative defenses, which would include, you know, her trying to create an issue of fact on, on the title, uh, can support a motion to strike as to which she bears the burden of proof of her affirmative defenses. Quote, whether the defendants have met their burden cannot be resolved when considering a motion to strike. Uh, see 243 Virginia at 83. And, and just to... Um, respond to Mr. Rottenborn's citation to the Lakova case, which we hadn't seen until he mentioned it today, I would only note, Your Honor, that defendant admits that she tweeted a link to the online version of the op-ed at paragraph 97 of her answer, though again, the, the admission of Exhibit 1 is more than enough to survive the uh, motion to strike. And the Lakova case at 995 F3rd 134 holds that republishing a hyperlink doesn't necessarily start the statute of limitations, not that a hyperlink uh, cannot be defamatory. So with that, Your Honor, we respectfully request that the court deny the motion to strike in full, and let's hear from Ms. Hurd. Right. Thank you, Your yes, Honor. Yes, sir. Thank you. Your motion. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. I, I can only assume that Mr. Chu wrote that speech for an audience outside the court because it didn't really address my arguments. I'm going to focus on what our specific arguments are for the motion to strike, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Chu spent almost 30 minutes of the court's time talking about the, the disputed evidence of physical abuse in this case, which Ms. Hurd hasn't even put on her case. And, and um, I can tell you she's not the abuser, and if the case moves forward, she and her witnesses will put on even more evidence of the physical abuse she suffered at the hands of Mr. Depp. But that's not the basis for our motion right now, Your Honor. He, he talks about how Mr. Depp uh, had a sworn denial um, and that that should count. He, he, we read his testimony. He claims he didn't strike her. But again, that's not the basis for our motion. The basis for our motion is the clear and undisputed evidence of non-physical abuse by his definitions, by his standards, by the standards of his expert. 
there is no dispute that Mr. Depp on abused Amber. And therefore, if he did it even one time, there is no dispute that even under their theory of the case, the implication that they want the jury to draw from the article, which again, I'm not arguing for the purposes of today, because under the legal standard, I'm not going to argue that. I'm not going to waste the court's time with that. But even under their standard, the undisputed evidence is that Mr. Depp did commit abuse against Ms. Heard, and therefore that those first two statements were false. That's, that's our argument on that. As to the headline, it's funny, Mr. Chu, we played you know, two or three hours of an ACLU deposition, and now he says, well, that, that wasn't our witness. It was his witness, Your Honor. He just spent 10 minutes talking about what Mr. Doherty said, and Mr. Doherty testified that the Washington Post wrote the headline. That is the only evidence, Your Honor. I understand he says, well, Exhibit 1 has her name on it. Exhibit 1 has her name on it. But the only evidence in this case about who wrote that headline is Mr. Doherty's testimony. It is undisputed. They could have put anyone else on it. They could have called Ms. Heard for that because that was not part of the stipulation at the, at the pretrial conference. It was only the tweet that we talked about, Your Honor, and they chose not to do that. Now, Ms. Heard will testify she didn't write that headline, so it wouldn't have helped them. But the, the, they've had three weeks to put on their case, Your Honor. They've controlled the playing field of evidence. There is no dispute that Ms. Heard did not write that headline. No dispute. Simply saying, well, her name is attached to it, that can't overcome the testimony of the ACLU. They call them a co-conspirator. Of course, Mr. Depp chose not to sue them. Um, but the testimony of Terrence Doherty, that she didn't write that headline, that takes care of the sexual violence headline, Your Honor. And I, I'm, I'm not going to take up any more of the court's time addressing portions of Mr. De or Mr. Mr. Chu's argument that don't go to, to our motion, unless Your Honor has any specific questions. But no, I want to be respectful. All right, thank, thank you. you, sir. All right. For this motion, I've taken the arguments of counsel, and last night I reviewed all of the evidence that has been submitted in this matter. So as to the second and third alleged def defamatory statements, um, at the motion to strike at this juncture, I view the evidence in the light most favorable to the plaintiff and reasonable inferences from the evidence to the plaintiff. And if there is a scintilla of evidence that a reasonable juror could weigh, then the matter survives a motion to strike. In this matter, there is evidence in the case that a jury could weigh that the statements were made by the defendant, that the statements were about the plaintiff, that the statement was published, that the statement is false, and the defendant made the statement knowing it to be false, or the defendant made it so recklessly as to amount to a willful disregard for the truth. The weight of that evidence is up to the fact finder. So the motion to strike is denied as to statement two and three. Uh, the motion to strike as to statement one, I'm going to take under advisement because um, if it's not a stipulation, I'm not sure what it is, but there seems to be an agreement that the tweet of Ms. Heard is part of the plaintiff's evidence, which is not in evidence at this point. So I can't rule on that statement whether or not it is just a tweet or if it's some sort of republication or something. I don't know because I haven't seen it yet. So as to the motion to strike on, on statement one, I'm going to take an advisement because ruling on it now, it would be premature because I just don't have that evidence in the case. Okay? Thank you very much, Your Honor. All right. Since it's 1230, we don't, you want to just take lunch? Uh, go ahead and let the jurors go to lunch and come back at 1.30. Does that sound okay? Uh, Okay. All right. Do you want to do it now? Okay, sure. All right.